Hi, my name is Emily Bell, and during my time at Gallatin, I've concentrated in narratives of peace and conflict, specifically looking at post-Soviet and post-communist states. In the spring of my sophomore year, I studied abroad at NYU Prague, where I learned for the first time what it meant to be in a city with living history. Even though Prague is architecturally stunning and has centuries of rich history, I found it fascinating that the history that lay closest to the surface was not the narrative that was being told. In November of 1989, the Velvet Revolution occurred, which toppled the Czech communist regime of more than 40 years. However, when you visit Prague as a tourist or as a researcher today, this is not the history that's being told, which is why over the past year, I've pursued two research questions relating to ideas of space, place, and ideology. First, what are the tangible remnants of a past ideology in a collective memory? And secondly, how does a memory form contain a narrative, but how can that narrative contradict the form? This is a map that you might receive from a tourist, or from a hostel, or a guidebook guiding a tourist in their kind of 36 hours in Prague edition. There are illustrated sites that you might want to visit, like the Prague Castle or the Charles Bridge. However, it's important to think about where this map came from and what it's trying to help you do. In theory, a map is supposed to help you in two dimensions navigate a space in three dimensions. And even though I am always lost, regardless of a map, I find it incredibly interesting to think about the people who make the maps that are given to us. The maps are being given to navigators as being facilitated through lenses of politics and economics and culture. It's just as important to be able to locate yourself in a space as it is to be able to understand what you're not seeing. As scholar Andres Hussein argued, the strong marks of present space merge in the imaginary with traces of the past. And even though he wrote this mainly about Berlin and Buenos Aires and New York, I believe that the same ideas can be applied to Prague, and that in this imaginary space, this memory space, the past and the present come together through specific spatial forms. This is a map that's being distributed by the European Union as part of official tourism to Prague. Even though it says it's a map of monuments and architecture of Prague through the centuries, nothing in this map relates to the time period of 1948 to 1989, the Czech Communist regime, or post-1989, after the Velvet Revolution. This is telling you one narrative of Czech history, the narrative of a fairy tale city hidden beneath the Iron Curtain. But I'm interested in what comes after that narrative which is why I began to think about collective memory within a spatial framework. And even as we're thinking abstractly about memory and place, there are distinct and tangible forms that construct the spatial memory terrain. These include museums, memorials, monuments, and ruins. Prague has a multiplicity of memory forms relating to its communist past. However, if you don't have a map that can show you where you're going, or if you don't know how to navigate the space that you're in, it's incredibly easy to miss these forms. First, I'd like to talk about an unconventional museum example. From an American perspective, I view a museum as an educational space, or perhaps a space to see objects of historical value. However, the Museum of Communism in Prague, which is privately owned by an American businessman who made his wealth off of a bagel chain, it's important to think about the motivations behind such an institution. It sits above a casino and next to a McDonald's, and all of the normative expectations of what you would think you're entering in a museum space are proven wrong as soon as you enter through the gift shop, where posters such as this one are sold. This reads, it was a time of happy, shiny people. The shiniest were in the uranium mines. <laughs> Today, this would not be politically correct to sell anywhere in the United States. However, I think it's important to note an emphasis on kitsch and commercialism over education and historical authenticity. This is one narrative of the Czech communist history that's being told, a narrative that's being driven towards tourists. But it's not that all of Czech communist memory is fun and games. There are serious memorial spaces, such as the one that sits at the top of these stairs. This is the memorial to the victims of communism, which was unveiled by the Czech government in 2002 and was destroyed by an unclaimed explosion in 2003. Along the steps of this memorial are statistics that describe what happened to different people during the communist regime, including disappearances and executions. However, today, this memorial, which is a space intended for reconciliation or remembering, blends into the hillside in which it's placed, 
so that it's simultaneously absorbed and then represented to the public as a space designated for remembering, as a space designated for the serious remembrance of crimes committed by a government that isn't too far in the past. However, if you didn't know the context of this, it would be pretty easy to miss, similarly to what we see in this photo. This is Wenceslas Square, one of the main squares in the heart of urban Prague, and at the top is the National Museum. You might also be distracted by the very large statue of St. Wenceslas on a horse. However, when we zoom further in on this photo, we see this plaque, which was hidden inside of the bush in the previous photo. I was in Prague for the first time for four months, and I never noticed that this plaque was located here until I returned explicitly under the purpose of research. This is a plaque to Jan Pollock and Jan Zajik, two students who self-immolated in 1969 towards the end of the Prague Spring. By lying literally underfoot, there are two memory potentials for this plaque. The first is that it comes to uphold the way that the Czech consciousness thinks about narratives of dissent and heroism. However, because it does sit literally underfoot, it also means that it's incredibly easy to overlook, especially by tourists. It's important to note at this time that even though we can group people experiencing these places into outsiders or tourists or insiders or people who live in Prague or are of Czech heritage, as more and more time passes from 1989, the group of who can be considered an insider or implicitly understanding the context of plaques like this shrinks. A space that's hard to forget is this room behind me. This is the embalming scene of former Czech President Clement Gottwald, who died in 1953. This room, which is now called the Mausoleum of Power, is located inside of the National Monument on Vitkov Hill. This is a monumental space that really utilizes all five senses. In addition to a visible shift in lighting, because you have to go down the stairs, there's also a shift in temperature and an incredibly strong smell of chemicals that still permeates this room. By creating a literal recreation in the space where the embalming occurred, this is a space and a narrative of memory that forces you in the present into the past. However, because it's a recreation, there's always a step of removal between yourself and that past narrative. Another example of something that's kind of removed from the present, but is still definitely there, is this. No, not the giant statue of Stalin, which when it was built was the largest group statue of Stalin in Europe, but the platform that it's standing on. The statue was unveiled in 1955 and was destroyed less than 10 years later. However, the base remains and has since been repurposed. This is the metronome, which was unveiled in 1991 and repurposes the ruins of the base of the Stalin statue. In this repurposing and being literally placed on top of what was once there, it makes it almost impossible to tell that it is actually a ruin. Today, Czech youth use the back part of the platform as a skateboarding park, and a bar named Stalin has even opened inside of the base. <laughs> this is a nod in some senses to Czech irony about their communist past, but in other senses it proves how the manipulation of linguistics and of space can combine together to create a decontextualized sense of memory. If you don't know what you're standing on, it's hard to understand the significance of it. Which is why it's important to think about why we're talking about memory in the first place. Memory discourses converge on nostalgia and melancholy. However, I find it helpful as a frequent traveler to think about where I'm going and the space and the time that informs those experiences. Which is why I've created this. This is my personal memory map that is an amalgamation of the sites that I've discussed previously, as well as many others. This is a personalized mental exercise that is a way to change the way we interact with our spaces. It's constantly evolving and has changed significantly since my first visit to Prague as a typical study abroad student and my second visit with the implicit purpose of research. The interesting part of this map, though, is that when we dissolve the map itself, we're just left with the sites of memory. And in this way, similar to perhaps psychogeography, we're able to change the way we alter and move around our spaces. We're able to layer our personal individual memory maps into a collective. For example, if I bring my personal experiences, my experiences in the classroom, my conversations with my friends, my other travels into a space that's explicitly designed 
for memory, and you do the same, we've now changed that space that we've entered. We've contributed to the narrative, we've taken things away, and ultimately a new narrative is produced, such that there is always a collective memory. Even if we're not able to acknowledge it implicitly, it lies, as the French theorist Maurice Hallbach says, like a screen over our experiences. However, I didn't need to travel thousands of miles away from home in order to start thinking about space and place and traumatic ruptures in history. This is a memorial to the Confederacy that sits in a park in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. This is an incredibly contested object currently, as some people want it destroyed, and other people simply want it moved to an educational context. But regardless of what happens to this memorial or to any of the examples in Prague, it's important to think about the way as consumers of history, whether insiders or outsiders or some gray area in between, we receive the forms that are given to us. It's not just about critiquing the narratives of history, which we now know are written by the victors, it's also about critiquing the forms that present those narratives of memory to us. By building and changing and layering our personal memory maps and experiences, it's a way to change the way we interact with the spaces. It's not that you can't go to a kitchen museum and take home a souvenir. And it's not that when you visit a place for 36 hours, you can only see all 15 sites relating to one thing. It's the idea of creating a balance, of entering something with a critical perspective. And in this sense, that is where our consumer responsibility lies. There's a significant difference between being a critical consumer of history and being a complacent one. Thank you.